Hi, I'm Sam Landsman from Slowboat.com. And I'm Laura Domala from Slowboat.com. Today, we'll be talking about Cape Caution. Cape Caution is another significant gate as we head north. We leave the Broughtons in southern BC and move up into the northern BC coast. The reason it's a significant gate and it's really different from the gates we've talked about in previous webcasts is that you have ocean swells plus wind waves here. So you're open to the Pacific Ocean and it's for a lot of boaters, it's the first time they'll ever have their boat out in ocean conditions. And that's nothing to be particularly concerned about, but it is something to be aware of and take into account when you're planning a trip around Cape Caution. About how long are we out in the ocean? You're only actually out in the ocean for about 40 miles. So from the Walker Group up to Fury Cove is about 40 nautical miles. And then you're back into protected water until you get all the way up to Dixon Entrance, the Alaskan border. Once we get north of Cape Caution, the cruising is much more wilderness cruising and yeah. remote. It's really a different type of cruising. There are a lot fewer marinas. There's still some marinas, but there are fewer marinas. Fewer there are services, right? Yeah, there's sure water and that has full services, but there's not much else on the central coast. So fuel uh, and water is a lot harder to get. Once yeah, you're... you really need to be more self-reliant. You're going to be anchored out a lot of the time. You're going to be, most of the time, you're going to be anchored out probably. And you're not going to be as near to major city services as you are in areas south of Cape Caution. Right. So let's talk about our preferred route. Normally, we like to depart Port McNeil. And Port McNeil is a good place to wait for weather and also to provision for the time that you'll spend in northern BC. Right. One of the challenges is there's no supermarket from the time you leave Port McNeil or Port Hardy until you get to Prince Rupert. So there's that whole section of coast really without any true supermarket or big box shopping. You have some smaller options. You have grocery stores in Shearwater and at Bella Bella, but you don't have the big box type of stores right. that you'd have have elsewhere. The grocery store in Bella Bella is pretty good. They're generally well stocked. They only get deliveries once or twice a week. And so you sometimes can get there right after a delivery and you've got good fresh produce options and meat options. And other times you arrive and the shelves are pretty bare, pretty bare. but <laughs> that's just the nature of cruising up on that part of the coast. All right, so we depart Port McNeil and we head for Ripple Passage. You're gonna head up towards Ripple Passage and you're gonna pass the Walker Group. And the Which Walker is, Group- you can see right here. And yep. there's a little narrow entryway and there's a few little anchorages in there or just one? There's really just one, one good anchorage in the Walker Group and it's a pretty spot. It looks like it's tight to get into on the chart, but I've been in there a number of times and you can fit three or four boats pretty easily in there. It's not as shallow or difficult as it looks in the chart when you actually go in there. Cool, okay, so we don't need to duck out. Sometimes I like to just go through there because it's pretty. <laughs> it is really pretty. So assuming your weather is good, then you continue north and Slingsby Channel can cause a little bit of a problem if there's rougher water and a big ebb at Slingsby Channel. That can be problematic. You get waves stacking up because of the current. And actually during the ebb, the whole area can get a little bit dicier. So it's not uncommon during the ebb to have the waves pretty tightly spaced. And even when it's not very rough out generally, but once it starts flooding or goes slack, the waves tend to spread out and smooth out the ride. We also like to keep about one nautical mile distance from Cape Caution at least. That's a great idea because there's some offlying rocks. And when you see, even on a calm day, you'll see the swells hitting shore and they- Pretty dramatic. Yeah. Yeah, there's all that spray <laughs> and there's a lot of force there and you want some sea room in case something goes wrong on your boat and you need to fix something or sure and if it's foggy you... yeah so at least a nautical mile off cape caution and if it's rough go further out the other thing is as you get closer into shore the waves start to reflect offshore and it can cause some more confused and uncomfortable conditions than if you stay a little further offshore so from cape caution you're going to turn a little bit more north i like leaving egg island to starboard so stay offshore of egg island right and then i typically go into fury Cove. It's one of the first good anchorages. It's a very scenic spot. It's protected. You can see through the little notch out into Fitzhugh Sound. It gives you a chance to kind of eyeball the weather too when you leave in the morning. Yep. Just to give people a frame of reference, it's going to be about 70, 75 nautical miles from Port McNeil to Fury Cove. So for most of us in trawler type boats, that's a full day of boating. And so Fury Cove is one of the first good anchorages. It's got plenty of room for all the boats that are ever likely to be there. It's got a nice sandy beach, yeah, shelly beach actually. It, there's a little cabin in the woods that kayakers mm -hmm. sometimes use and it's just a great spot well protected from all weather easy to get into even if it's rough out or foggy that would be my choice if you want to go a little further another good option is Pruth Bay Hakai Institute is there and it's a beautiful spot they're great sandy beaches you can
can hike to. And if you need fuel when you're coming up, you have two options in Rivers Inlet. You have Duncan B Landing and Dawson's Landing. They both have docks where you can tie up and get power and fuel and water and so forth. Okay, and then another route is to stick closer to the mainland. So say you're departing the Broughtons instead of Port Hardy or Port McNeil. Right, so if you're departing the Broughtons, you're going to probably overnight in Blunden Harbor, Allison Harbor. This option tends to take you a little closer to Slingsby Channel. And if you're so inclined, you could actually go through Slingsby Channel and Nequacto Rapids and go into Seymour Inlet and Belize Inlet. But that's pretty off the beaten path cruising and not frequented by most cruisers. Okay, so let's talk about weather resources. For us, we're normally checking Environment Canada forecasts and conditions. My weather planning for going around Cape Caution starts with looking at the Environment Canada Queen Charlotte Strait forecast. And on a northbound trip, this is going to be your first challenge. And it's typically not a big deal. The swells aren't affecting the strait, but the strait separates Vancouver Island from the mainland. And you can get some blustery weather in there. It's typically not as bad as further north. So if it's good enough at McInnes Island to Pine Island, then it's going to be good enough at Queen Charlotte Strait. But occasionally you get a situation where that's not the case. And also the conditions at the West Sea Otter weather buoy. Yeah, There's and, also the light station. Yeah, the Pine Island and Egg Island light stations are also super useful for because actually now, looking at what, what's right? happening. So, the, yeah. so when you're up at the crack of dawn at Port McNeil or wherever you're jumping off from, the light stations and the weather buoy are telling you what's actually happening out there right now. So that yeah. can help you determine how accurate the forecast is and whether or not you really want right. to go out there. The forecast, you kind of want to be looking at days before you're about to leave just to know what the trend is. But the light stations and the weather buoys will give you conditions right now. Right. And actually, that's a good point, Laura, because it's important to be looking at the forecast for several days ahead of time. So I like looking at it starting about three or four days before I plan to go around. Mm -hmm. And with the understanding that if the conditions are predicted to worsen dramatically, I might try to get ahead of the weather. And if they're going to get better, I might slow down with the goal of not getting stuck in one place. So not going over Port McNeil and then having to wait for four for, or five days yeah. in one spot. So I'll speed up or slow down my trip through the Broughtons so I can take advantage of a weather window going around Cape Caution. The other thing that I like to look at just to build a bigger picture is the Environment Canada forecast for Queen Charlotte Sound. And that's actually offshore of the route that we describe here, offshore of any route that you'd likely take. But it gives you an idea of what's happening 10, 20 miles out compared to the Central Coast forecast, which is really what's happening right on the coast. Great. Okay. And Sam, do you want to also talk about the effect of the current for this crossing? Right. We talked a little bit about Slingsby Channel and actually the ebb can really cause things to stack up outside of Slingsby Channel, but it also can cause things to stack up outside of Rivers Inlet, outside of Smith Sound, outside of just about any of these mainland inlets. The current flowing out and the swell coming in, although it doesn't increase in height particularly, it gets close together and much more uncomfortable. So a flood is preferred. Yeah, I like to do it on a flood if I can. It's such a long trip that normally mm. you're not going to be able to do the entire thing on a flood. And the other thing to remember is if you're doing this trip and in calm conditions, the current doesn't matter all that much. So it's only on a more marginal crossing when the current really comes into play. And I like using the Ports and Passes current book. You can also use the Canadian Hydrographic Service current books, but the Ports and Passes book is the easiest to use. All right, let's share the conditions that we like for a good crossing. What are your minimums? So I like to see West Sea Otter at a meter and a half or less. And one other thing on this is I'd want to see the wave period in seconds be longer than the wave height in feet. Right. So if your waves are six feet and your seconds are six seconds between them, I always want the seconds to be longer than the wave height. Right. So at six feet at six seconds is going to be, a, it's going to be choppy. It's yeah. going to be waves stacked up. They might not be breaking, but they're going to be close. Whereas if you have six feet at 20 seconds, it's going to be a nice lazy Calm ocean swell. rolling swells. Yeah. And that's an important important distinction. And one of the really useful resources for figuring out if it's choppy versus swelly is the Pine Island and Egg Island weather reports from the light keepers there. And so I'm looking for when I'm leaving Port McNeil, a two foot chop or less at Pine Island and Egg Island. Mm -hmm. I'll consider it three foot moderate, but at three foot moderate, the boat's going to be getting wet. It's going to be time to lash things down and make sure everything's secure inside. And it's going to be a bumpy ride. Four foot, five foot gets into the realm of shouldn't be out there. Yeah. Of course, I want to see a favorable forecast. I don't want to depart with a forecast where they're calling for greatly increasing winds right. throughout the day. You're out there exposed for quite a few hours because of the distance is involved. And so I don't want to be trying to race ahead of weather. If it's an issue of hours, then it's probably a little bit too tight for me. Mm -hmm. Also, and, you said earlier, flood current, if it's rough, but if the forecast is great, then yep. you don't have to worry about yep. that. If it's calm, the current doesn't matter so much, but if it's going to be a marginal crossing, then go for the flood. Right. Fog is okay. Yeah. Fog usually means it's calm. So you can see here in this photo, the fog bank up ahead of us. Yeah, and more often than not, the 
the fog is kind of your friend. We have technology like radar and AIS that you should really know how to use. Right. They show us what's out there and there's not similarly accessible technology to totally smooth out the ride that you might experience. So I'd rather go when it's foggy and calm than when it's a little bit windier and when it's clear. Me too. Right. Also, another thing to be aware of, especially in fog, are the VTS lanes and other traffic. Yeah, it's remote certainly up here, but it's surprisingly busy. There's traffic of all types. There's tugs and barges and fishing boats, both commercial and recreational and charter fishing boats and cruising boats, cruise ships, ferries, all sorts of things. Yep. And normally when the weather is good, especially if people have been waiting for a few days. Everyone goes at once. Everyone's yep. out there. And yep. the northbound and southbound traffic seems to converge right around Cape Caution. And so if you've all put your waypoint as a point a mile off of Cape Caution, it gets shockingly crowded all of a sudden. Yeah, because everyone's done the same thing. Especially in the fog, you need to be paying attention to your radar, you need to be paying attention to AIS. Even though it feels like you're out there alone, you're probably not. And Which also is kind of a nice feeling. Yeah, too. it's comforting to know there are other people right. nearby. And then at the Cape Caution line, the VTS traffic channel shifts. And so it goes from Victoria traffic on channel 71 south of Cape Caution to Prince Rupert traffic on channel 11 north of Cape Caution. And so you'll want to make that switch on your second radio or your scanning frequencies because it's pretty handy to be able to listen to the traffic. You'll be made aware of commercial traffic that's using the area. And especially if you don't have AIS receiver, it's good to be listening to the VTS channels to see where the big guys are. So this is some video I took last year on my way around Cape Caution. It was not totally calm. You can see there's a little bit of boat movement, but this was a two foot moderate that turned into a one foot chop that turned into even calmer conditions. I think it was a little over a one meter swell and you can see that it's just pretty darn calm out there. The boat's moving and that's to be expected. You're going to have motion, but it doesn't have to be super rough when you're out of Cape Cosh and you can get around there with a minimum of hassle and discomfort. Great. Well, we hope this was all helpful for everyone. Yeah. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, just let us know slowboat.com and contact us. And thanks for joining us. To see more of our educational boating videos, subscribe to our Slow Boat YouTube channel. If you're on Facebook, you can follow us at facebook.com slash slowboatlife. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at slowboatlife. And of course, you can always find us on slowboat.com. Until next time, see you on the water.